bow to babe on bended knee, the Savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born, he shall reign Brothers and sisters, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome this morning to Forest Grove. And why have we gathered on a morning like this? We've gathered to be reminded of who we are, that we are indeed the people of God, his beloved sons and daughters who he is madly in love with. And we've come to be reminded of who he is. He is the Savior of the world, the one that all creation will one day gather around his throne and cry out, Holy, Holy holy. So welcome this morning to Forest Grove, friends. We especially want to welcome those who are joining us on our live stream on Facebook. We're glad you're with us there as well. A few announcements for us this morning. Uh, First, uh, we have our cold weather gear uh, drive going in the back. There is a box back there. You can drop it in. So gloves, mittens, a hat, scarves, those type of things. Um, And those will be going to our ministry partners at Jehovah Jireh here shortly. So be sure to drop those off. Uh, Next Sunday will be the last Sunday to drop them off. Uh, Today is the last Sunday to drop off your Christmas cards uh, if you want them distributed. So be sure to, if you forgot them this morning, maybe you run back after church and and grab them and bring them back because we're going to finish sorting them uh, probably this afternoon and get them ready to get out. Um, So note that. 
This coming Thursday is our blue Christmas service that Randy talked a little bit about last week. Uh, it's a service for people who, um, it's not for everybody, but maybe you're in a space where uh, it's a little bit hard to celebrate Christmas this year. Maybe um, there's somebody who's missing around your dinner table or other things going on in your life. And so this is just a space just to acknowledge um, grief in the midst of a season of celebration. So we encourage you to come out Thursday night at 7 p.m. If you're not able to make it here, it will be live streamed on our Facebook page. And then next week, Thursday, if you can believe it or not, it's already our Christmas Eve service. It's coming super quick, and so we're excited for our Christmas Eve service, 7 o'clock. Again, uh, here, or if you can't join us here, join us on our Facebook live stream. Um, it's just going to be a great night of stories and reminding ourselves of the Christ child that came in. Uh, and we're also going to encourage you, if you are a lover of some of the old Christmas songs and you want to sing them out loud, um, about gather here about 6.40, 6.45. We're going to start doing some hymn sing um, with some of those um, classic Christmas songs ahead of time. So if you want to join us for that, uh, get here a few minutes early. Uh, my final announcement is just a reminder that our offering boxes are in the back. Um, and also, you can also continue to give on our website if you're not able to join us in person today. So with those things said, I want to uh, invite the Barr family up, and they are going to light our third candle as we continue our Advent journey this morning. I dream of dance parties in the kitchen. I dream of laughter that is contagious. I dream of birthday candles and another beautiful year. I dream of family game nights and dinner parties with friends. I dream of homemade family recipes with family around the table. I dream of pillow forts, fireflies, and front porch swings. I dream of every little thing that brings joy and I know it comes from God. So today we light the candle of joy as a reminder that God's dream for this world involves the end of all tears. God's dream for the world involves a joy that overflows and is contagious. So may this fire burn bright, and as it does, may we sing. May we dance. May we laugh. May we hold on to the people that we love. May we sow joy in a hurting world, and may it be an act of holy resistance. Amen. Bar family. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give up on give up do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart Take courage. Wait for the Lord. As we're in this season of Advent, we remember that there were prophecies of a coming Messiah, and the Israelites waited for centuries to see those prophecies fulfilled. And we take this time during this Advent season to wait for the coming of the Christ child. Let's stand together. I taught this song uh, last week. We're going to sing these words again. Wait for the long. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart.
and ransom captive Israel, and mourns in lonely exile here until the sun. Waiting, waiting for the Christ child, waiting for peace on earth. Lord, help us to be a people that helps to usher in that peace on earth. Help us to be a people that waits for you, Lord, but when you give us direction, help us to act where you call us to act. Father, as we worship you this morning, we pray that your name would be glorified and that all glory and honor would be given unto you. It's the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray and all God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. It's uh, easy to want to do things our own way. We don't like to wait. We're a people, especially in America, we like our instant gratification. We want what we want, and we want it now. And sometimes God calls us to wait. I want to go back to that psalm that I read uh, as our call to worship, Psalm 27. In the last two verses, it says, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. It's something that we have to practice to wait. It's something that we have to work on because it, it doesn't come naturally to us. And in this season, it's hard because we've read the story many, many, many times. We know how the story ends, and yet God calls us to wait. And it's good to sit in that waiting. So in, in our time of confession this morning, we're going to just, I want you to kind of think about those times where, where we get ahead of ourselves, where we get ahead of God in our lives, and just think about 
taking some time during this Advent season to wait. We're going to sing um, a song that we've sung before a few weeks ago. Um, it's called Psalm 126, and um, this week's theme is Those Who Dream So Joy, and uh, we're going to sing a little bit about that now, so please join us. these words of assurance from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made, he remembers that we are dust. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, praise team. Uh, friends, just uh, one uh, just update for you for prayer, before we go into prayer. Um, Bud Sprick had a back surgery, and if you're on the prayer team, you've seen that that went well, and so we just bless God for that. Um, at the end of our time of prayer today, we're going to have the words of the Lord's Prayer up on the screen, and we invite you to uh, pray these words with us at the end of my prayer today. So you pray with me, friends.
although we are weeping. Lord, help us keep sowing. Lord, we sit in this moment, in this space, and we just thank you for who you are, for your compassion, for your mercy, for the joy that we can find in you. And yet, Lord, we recognize that there's a lot of hard stuff going on around us, and and sometimes it's really hard to sow songs of joy. We are more like the ones that are weeping. We think of those in our midst, in our community, and, and really all around the world that are struggling with still the impact and the after, um, aftermath of um, the COVID pandemic. We thank you for the good news this week that some vaccines are on their way, um, but yet, Lord, we know we have to continue to be patient and wait. It feels like we've waited forever. So, Lord, give us the grace and the strength to continue to be a patient people in the midst of everything going on in our world. Lord, we thank you for, and we thank you for Bud's uh, successful back surgery this week, and we bless you and we thank you for that. We also thank you for um, some people in our midst who have recovered from other things or um, good test results. Um, but Lord, we also recognize that there are some sitting here that are waiting test results and are sitting in the unknown. So Lord, um, we ask your comfort and your peace upon them. Lord, we also just uh, want to pause and we lift up our, our teachers in this community as our elementaries and middle schools are back in person and our high school is online, Lord. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot of challenges uh, that our teachers and administrators are facing, Lord. So we just want to lift them up before you, in particular our school right across the street here at Forest Grove Elementary. We also want to pray for our Christian Learning Center ministry in our basement, Lord. We thank you for Becky and for her team, but we know it's been a challenge for them as they've had staff quarantined and um, some staff has had to work extra and jump around and do things to make it work. And so we just um, thank you for their diligence and we just pray health um, and healing um, for the CLC team downstairs. God, as you sent your son down into this world, and we await that day here in just less than two weeks now, when we get to celebrate that gift. But we recognize that he came into this world to save us from our own brokenness, from our own sin, so that we could be in right relationship with you. And so we thank you, Lord, for that gift. Forgive us for the times that we take that gift for granted. But as Jesus, your Son, our Savior, walked this world and showed us what it looks like to live the life that we were designed to live, he sat with his disciples and he taught them to pray. And so, Lord, we want to echo the words that you taught your children to pray. And so together, we pray the Lord's Prayer and the lyrics are up on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. So this past week, on Tuesday, I had 
the privilege to officiate Mary Smulligan's funeral. It was just a small, intimate gathering of a family that was gathered here, but it was a, a beautiful morning. You know, since I arrived here shortly before COVID hit, I never got a chance to go and visit with Mary and get a chance to, to know her. But I did get the privilege of sitting with some of her family last Sunday afternoon. I got to hear many stories of, of Mary. The adventures she went on, the, the trips, the stories from the slaughterhouse. And as I listened to these stories, I found myself saying a couple times, man, I want to be a little bit more like Mary in that regard. As a pastor, I get to sit in a lot of those spaces where you get to hear stories of, of loved ones who have passed away. I have often found myself saying, man, I want to be a little bit more like that person. I'm guessing at some point, maybe in your life, you've felt the same way too. A couple of years ago, um, I was asked to do the funeral for an eight-year-old girl from our church who had passed away in a, in a tragic car crash the day before Easter. As I spent time listening to the family in the midst of their sorrow and their tears, they told me about a recent dream that their, their little daughter had. She dreamed of getting a buddy bench out on her school's playground so that when somebody felt lonely at recess, they could go and sit on this buddy bench and then her or some other friends would come along and invite them to participate with what they're doing at recess time. After hearing her dream, this story, I found myself wanting to be a little bit more like that eight-year-old girl. Have you had those moments in your life? I think I'm drawn to these stories, and, and maybe you're drawn to them too, because if we think about them, they're really stories of God's faithfulness. They're stories of how God uses his people to fulfill his dreams, to, to reconcile and redeem this world back to himself. You see, friends, even in our sorrow, even in the tough moments of life, God has a part for us to play in his dreams that he has for this world that he so loves. And friends, it's certain to be for our good and for his glory somehow. You see, the people of God have known the pain and the hurt of this life. They have been exiles. They were slaves. They spent years wandering in the wilderness. And yet, somewhere in recalling all these stories, the author of the psalm that we're about to read recognized that God had done some pretty amazing things in the midst of their brokenness and their tears. Listen to these words, friends, from Psalm 126, which we just sang a couple moments ago. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter our tongues with songs of joy. It was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams of the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Psalm 126, friends, is, is really a community lament. It recalls the, the moments 
of God's mercy on his people. They recognized how God had moved in the past and even in the midst of their tears. They recognized how God had taken the seeds that they had sown in their tears and in their weeping, and out of those seeds, they were able to find a way to sing songs of joy. They found joy in God's mercy and faithfulness. And they found joy in God using them for God's purposes in this world. As we continue our Advent journey this morning, I'm reminded of one person in particular from the Christmas story who I think felt the weight of sowing in tears and reaping songs of joy. Her name is Mary, the mother of Jesus. You probably know of her. We see when we encounter Mary in the Bible, uh, from the best we can tell, she's probably about a 13 or 14-year-old girl, which was about the typical time when a young woman would, uh, in that day would get engaged. But in Mary's day, the the marriage process looked a little bit different than it does for us today. You see, parents would typically have some significant say in some type of an arrangement for the marriage of their children. It kind of differed a little bit between community to community, but there was a a certain amount of, of the parents' involvement in that process. So once the arrangements were made then, the couple would be what we would call engaged, But really, legally in Mary's day and age, they would be considered married at that point. Then, after the arrangements were finalized, the husband would leave and would go back to his family's household and would build typically an addition onto the house, another room for him and his wife to be able to live in. And once that place was was ready, then the husband would go back would take his bride, and the two would come back into their community, and they would celebrate officially at that point the marriage of the couple. So if we look at the text this morning, we look at Scripture, what we recognize is that Mary, when we find that she is carrying a child, she is already legally married in that culture. Her husband, Joseph, was probably still working on that room addition on the house, and so he had not come yet to take her back to his home. So essentially to the community that Mary and Joseph were living in, it would have appeared that Mary had had an affair while she was waiting for Joseph to come back to take her. How else would she have been, become pregnant if it weren't for Joseph? Joseph. This directed all kinds of shame on Mary from her community. Mary's heart was most certainly filled with confusion and hurt and pain over the situation. And yet, and yet in the midst of her tears, the Bible records Mary singing a song. It went went like this. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. 
You know, if that was me writing that song or singing that song, I don't know if though I would have sang it just like Mary. You know, Mary had every reason to be pretty mad at God in that moment. Her song most certainly could have sounded like one of those psalms of lament filled with emotions of frustration and anger and doubting God's plans and his purposes. You know, Mary's pregnancy with, with baby Jesus seemingly just messed up her entire life. Her community would disown her. And who knows if she'd still be able to marry Joseph or even marry anyone for that matter. Her dreams and her world had just gotten flipped upside down. And yet, somewhere in her tears, she began to sing that beautiful song. A song of hope, a song of remembrance. So this morning, I want us to lean into Mary's song this morning. I want to look a little bit closer at that song and see what we might discover about how Mary is able to still sow seeds of joy even in the midst of her tears. I have three things in particular I want to draw our attention to this morning. The first one is this, that in Mary's song, we see her humbling herself before God and recognizing who God is. In verse 48, Mary speaks of God and says this, being mindful of the humble state of his servant. If you were with us last week, we talked about John the Baptist and how he had to humble himself before God. We talked about this image of, of Jesus having sandals on. And John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals on Jesus' feet. And we remembered that the job of untying the sandals would have been the servant or the slave of the household. And so John humbled himself and he said, I'm not even worthy to do the servant's job to, for Jesus. And then we met another person. Um, remember, it's the woman with the alabaster jar, and, and she came to Jesus. And, and she, in her weeping, she, she wet Jesus' feet with her tears and then used her hair and wiped them clean and poured perfume on them and kissed his feet. Again, humbling herself before God. And now this morning, Mary is also humbling herself to one of the lowest positions in her community, that being of a servant. And so really in doing so, Mary is able to declare in the midst of her tears, the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. There's something to be said, I think, friends, about going through tough times and, and needing to remember who we are, and whose we are. A tool in our Reformed tradition called the Heidelberg Catechism, maybe some of you are familiar with it, reminds us that we are not our own, but we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We're so quick, though, in our brokenness to make the center of our lives about ourselves. We live in a, a, a culture that constantly tells us that message too. And yet the, yet the call as followers of Jesus is to humble ourselves. Just like Mary did. So that Jesus can be at the center of our lives and can be the center of all we do and, and our lives revolve around Jesus. We need to humble ourselves. The second thing I want to draw our attention to this morning is that Mary seems to remind herself that sometimes when we sow seeds in our weeping, we might not be able to see the fruit 
of our labor. In verse 50, Mary saying these words, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. When I was younger, my grandparents, my grandma and grandpa Weichers, um, bought, my, bought me an uh, apple tree, and we planted it right outside of my window uh, at my, where my parents still live. And I remember that for the apple tree as a young one, I was maybe first grade, kindergarten, something like that. Um, and I remember having huge dreams for that apple tree. I, I dreamed of having a big roadside apple stand in the fall that I could sell all my apples and so I could buy some more candy and toys and uh, everything I wanted as my first grade self. Um, and then I also had some dreams of the apple tree growing big enough that I could build this massive clubhouse in the midst of my apple tree. Little did I know as a first grader, it took a few years to even get much of a crop at all in that tree, let alone, I don't think it's still big enough, you know, 25 years later to, to put a clubhouse up in it. In the Bible times, we, we, they, they talk about a, a tree, in particular Abraham talks about this tree. I've talked about it before, it's called a, a tamarisk tree. The rabbis would tell you that you don't plant the tamarisk tree to sit under its shade, shade yourself, but you plant the tamarisk tree for the future generations to be able to sit under its shade. It takes a long time for the tamarisk tree to grow the deep roots in the soil, in that desert soil, so it can grow up tall. You see, for some of us, we have to remind ourselves and we kind of live in a world where we want that tree to be growing really quick, but yet sometimes God's trees are like more like that tamarisk tree or, or my apple tree. We have all kinds of plans and, and thoughts in our heads of what we want to do, but at the end, it's up to, it's up to God's timing. And you see, sometimes we sow seeds in our lives that we'll not realize until maybe we're gone, or maybe 5, 10, 20 years down the road. For some of us, we weep because maybe our spouse or our children or our grandchildren or, or maybe a friend doesn't know Jesus. And it seems like no matter what we try to, to say to them and, and to do, no matter what we're trying to do to sow that seed, the seed just doesn't seem to ever want to take root. Mary, I think this morning, reminds us to trust the fact that God doesn't always work on our schedules, but God is always at work. Our third point, our final point, that I want to draw from Mary's song is this, that Mary reminded herself that God has been faithful in the past and surely will be faithful in the future. For example, if we look at verse 54, she's saying these words, God has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now we have to remember, friends, that we have the benefit of being able to look at the, um, the New and the Old Testament of Scripture, excuse me, of Scripture, that we can see God's words all over, and we can see how God has been faithful, and yet Mary likely didn't have a copy of the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't even been thought of yet. The only way she would remember any stories was from her time when she would go to the synagogue and hear those stories. But I think as Mary is singing, she's really replaying all kinds of stories of God's faithfulness in her mind. And in recalling Abraham by name, I, I kind of wonder myself if she might be remembering God's promises to Abraham. You might remember the story. God promised Abraham that he would have a son with 
Sarah, his wife. And it didn't seem to be happening. It didn't seem to be happening. And so finally, Abraham decided to take things into his own hand and slept with Hagar, um, Sarah's servant, and, and she conceived, but that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was to do really what seemed impossible in that moment. And he used Sarah and Abraham, who were, who were probably too old really to conceive a son. And God did the impossible. And Abraham and Sarah bore a son, just as God promised. I wonder if Mary's not thinking about that story too as she's singing. I wonder if she too is not thinking about that promise of, of God. Would God really bring a, the Savior of the world into the world through her womb? Could, he, could she trust in God's promises? I wonder if she doesn't recall Abraham's story so she could remember God's faithfulness. Even in those moments when life seems a little bit impossible. And I think that helps Mary to rest. To rest in God's faithfulness. Indeed, she would bear the Savior of the world. Although Mary was sowing with tears, she was able to sing this song of joy. All of us in this season that we're standing in know of people who are going through difficult times. Maybe it's you that's going through that difficult time. But I wonder this morning if we might also be able to sing those songs of joy in the midst of our tears. This doesn't mean that everything's going to be okay right away. It doesn't even mean that you have to put a smile on your face. But it is an invitation. It's an invitation to, to gaze towards heaven and remind ourselves just how great God is. It's an invitation to remove ourselves from the center of our lives and instead orient our lives around the person of Jesus Christ. It's an invitation to recall the stories of God's faithfulness both in Scripture and in your own life. And it's an invitation to dream, to find our place in God's dream for this world that He so loves. Although, friends, we may sow in tears, Let's not lose sight of that great and glorious day when together we will be gathered around the throne crying out songs of joy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just look to Mary this morning. We just thank you and we bless you. We bless you for how you spoke into her life as just a 13 or 14-year-old girl and life was seemingly getting turned upside down. And yet she focused her eyes on you. She, and as she cried, as she wept, she sowed seeds of joy. She didn't know what the next 30-some years would look like for the little one that was in her womb. She had no clue that over 2,000 years later, uh, uh, people would be gathered here at Forest Grove Reform Church blessing God and, and worshiping the little one that was in her womb that day. God, you are faithful to your promises. So, Lord, remind us that you are indeed a faithful God. We love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Stand with us and sing this Advent hymn.
Praise team. Friends, as you go into this week, as we continue our Advent journey this week, go as people who sow seeds. Even in our weeping, we sow seeds, trusting that God will be faithful, trusting that God goes before us and makes a way. Even if we don't get a chance to glimpse it, we trust that God is at work. And friends, as you go into this week, go with this blessing. May God, seeking comfort, find you. May his loving arms bind you. May his might protect you and his wisdom direct you. And may the joy of Jesus Christ be with you both now and forevermore. Amen. If you just want to be seated for a moment, one of our elders will dismiss us momentarily.